Howdy, and welcome to the show. Cooper's Code examines a legal issue and hits the highlights so we all achieve the best results for our clients. I'm Miles Cooper, and today we're honored to have an opportunity to hear from a legend of the trial bar, James J. Brosnahan. Master in the courtroom, James Brosnahan has tried 150 cases to conclusion, ranging from antitrust to wire fraud, patent litigation, to white collar crime, and murder. All of them bet the company or bet your future cases. Some you might know include defending the Crows producers when Bruce Lee's son Brendan Lee died on set, the defense of John Walker Lind in the midst of the political turmoil following 9-11, and prosecutions relating to a little matter known as the Iran-Contra affair. Jim was inducted into the State Bar of California's High Lawyers Hall of Fame in 1996, has received similar awards for ethics, civility, and trial skills from almost every trial attorney organization worth its salt, founded what is now known as the Justice and Diversity Center for the Bar Association of San Francisco, and has been a master advocate, board of trustees member, and teacher of the year for the National Institute of Trial Advocacy. Jim just released Justice at Trial, Courtroom Battles, and Groundbreaking Cases, which provides his unique insights into trials, high stakes negotiations, and what makes good outcomes in cases. Check the show notes for a link to purchase his book. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to start kind of at the beginning and go into a little bit about rheumatic fever and some challenges you went through as a very young boy. I put that in the book because there might be young people out there who read the book and are encouraged that you can overcome what happened. I was diagnosed with rheumatic fever when I was three years old, and the doctor thought I should stay in bed till they figured out what was going on. I was in bed for about two and a half years, and that meant that I stayed in my room pretty much. Occasionally, I'd be taken down to my grandparents' house, but I remember being in a crib at the age of four, and... Then my father, he had a nice job, but it didn't pay very much. And he got the money for a second opinion. And the doctor said, you know, things get better or they get worse. Let the boy out. So at six, I went directly to the first grade, but I couldn't read. And um, that's the way I started. That led to early academic issues. And what got me out of that is the sports. And I played three sports in high school and two in college, gaining the confidence that allowed me to want to express myself in a way that dealt with my character, I think, as a trial lawyer. So the background I thought was important. That's why I put it in the book. The sports background, it sounds like you were quite the athlete. I understand that you tried out for the Red Sox in high school? I did. I had struck out 21 batters, I think primarily because I didn't know where the ball was going and the batters didn't know where the ball was going. So the Red Sox took notice and invited me in. I was in Fenway Park and these names might not be known to your audience, but I was putting on a Red Sox uniform and there was Ted Williams and all my wonderful heroes on the Red Sox team of the late 40s and early 50s. So I decided I was going to be a professional baseball player at that point. That's what I was going to be. And I played three sports in high school and was invited to play three sports at Boston College. And I turned out football because I thought I better study. And that was an awakening for me because I found out I love to study, and it was just the right time for me to develop my thinking process. So that worked out okay. And that is a good segue into a question I had, which is how does a student with a, as I understand it, a D minus average in high school, later find himself at Harvard Law? (laughs) I used to sit in high school in the back and... uh, Father Gil Martin would would yell out, Brosnahan, we only go this way once. You know, he he kind of picked on me because he knew I needed it. But sports was my old thing. I just waited for practice to begin in high school, basically. 
But once I got to Boston College, I got an A in a math test because I studied very hard after practice. In college, I played basketball and baseball. But I studied to keep my scholarship. And I really discovered that I had a brain. And more than that, it was the right moment for me. I began to really enjoy things like scholastic philosophy, which they taught at that time. And that actually became a lifetime interest. And I was on the dean's list just to keep my scholarship. And then I didn't think I was going to be a professional baseball player, but I debated it. You know how young people are. They have these funny thoughts. And I thought, well, if I'm a baseball player, I'll be done at 35. But if I'm a lawyer, which I was starting to think about, I'll be able to go till I'm 50. And, you know, 50 was way in the future somewhere. And, of course, I practiced till I was about 85. So it was a good decision uh, for me. In terms of going to law school, I understand that the financial implications of going to Harvard created a challenge for you and your family and that there was someone who helped out. And my subtext of that question is, did that help translate into some of the focus that you've had in your career on pro bono and other support services? I think so. I never thought we were poor, but looking back, I think we didn't have much money, so I guess that's poor. And I worked from the age of 14. I had every kind of job, and that helped me practice law. There was no kind of job that I didn't have. I drove a cab. I laid blacktop on the highways and work construction and work behind the counter, all those things. But I think that that experience was very, very helpful. And to answer your question, we didn't have the money to go because the first year at law school, you have to pay yourself. And that rule's been around. I don't know if it's still the rule at the Harvard Law School, but it was for many years. So I wasn't going to be able to go. And my mother just said, you're not going. We don't have the money. And that was true. What she said was correct. So my dad said, you know, maybe I'll find a way. And in the book, I describe his job at Symphony Hall. He he had no college education. He started as an office boy and eventually worked his way up to be one of the business administrators of the Boston Symphony Orchestra with no college education. And he was dealing with, it's kind of interesting, actually, it's in the book, but, you know, these musicians, famous people like Arthur Fiedler, who conducted the Pops, your audience may not remember that name, but he was very popular at the time. Anyway, my father went to Mr. Cabot, And Mr. Cabot was at the top of Boston's social structure. The Cabots were, there's something, a little ditty that's in the book that people can read. And Mr. Cabot just said, have Jim come to me, visit me. So I did. And he said he'd done some checking and uh, he opened the drawer, pulled out a check. And he said, this amount will allow you to live in Harvard Square, and that will add to your experience. And then he said, if you need more, you come back. Well, I didn't go back because I uh, preferred to work. So, yes, I identify with people that don't have enough money to do things. I get it. I really get it. And one of the items I worked on almost my whole professional life is the 90% of people who go to court in civil matters, small, medium, and large, don't have a lawyer. To me, there are many great things about law, but that is one of the worst defects in law. And I've worked on it since 1962 with friends who are real experts on that. And is this what is sometimes referred to as the Civil Gideon Project? Yes. I started practice a year before Gideon. That's a Supreme Court case which held that you have a right to a lawyer in a criminal case, but not a civil case. 
And the story of how I discovered that is in the book, and it's rather dramatic because it, before Gideon, the story in the book is about a murder case. And uh, who's going to represent this person? And that whole story is in the book. This was a murder on the Navajo Reservation. Yeah. And I was prosecuting at that. I prosecuted for five years. And I was in Phoenix, having moved there from Boston and with my wife, Carol. And I started researching, how can this be that, you know, people can't afford lawyers? And I've been working on it ever since. And because not everything needs to happen chronologically as we have our conversation, I feel now might be a good time to talk a little bit about why the Civil Gideon Project and the right to having an attorney help you, whether criminal or civil. Why was that so important for you? And what efforts have you undertaken over the years to make that a right? Well, I started to be active in the Bar Association, but even before that, I was active in things like the NAACP and MALDEF. I was on the board of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I was the secretary treasurer of that group when it, they, they started uh, in the late 60s. And so I had, it was all kinds of activity on my part. But when I got to be president of the bar, the question was, what am I going to work on? And there were two things that I thought then and I think now are at the heart of the conscience of lawyers, the way I think of it. One is the right to representation when you go to court. And there's a long analysis as to why that's a terrible situation. Uh, but, you know, you and I have been to law school three years. And we studied procedure. and We studied all manner of things. And now this person walks up to the lectern and they're frightened to death. The judges do what they can, but they can only do so much. So I started an organization. There had always been pro bono. I didn't invent pro bono, but I started an organization and asked everybody in the Bar Association to commit 5% of their time to pro bono. And we got a lot of people to sign up because that's the nature, the giving nature of lawyers in San Francisco and, and elsewhere, I must say. And so we staffed it. To be serious in this world, you have to have staff. So we hired someone, we started it, and it grew, it did grow over the years, but an awful lot of people made that possible. It was my idea, but a lot of people worked hard on that, and it's functioning today. And that was originally known as the Volunteer Legal Services yes, Program right. and is now the Justice and Diversity Center. Yes. I'll give a plug for it. Having done many hours at the lawyer assistance clinics, I love the single serving engagements with potential clients and the communities, the Tenderloin and, and Bayview that those clinics serve. I went uh, one night and uh, there was a heavy set woman uh, lived in the mission and she had signed a contract it didn't speak much english and the contract was in english and she was really concerned that her husband who had a temper evidently was gonna and so she owed 380 dollars and i the next day i wrote a letter to the president I, i've always kind of liked to go to the president of something you know it's amazing what happened I've done it about five times in my career. I, I've got results every time. So I wrote to him and I said, basically, the entire law firm of Morrison Forrester is going to do nothing but sue you. Okay, that's all we're going to do. I've got all the volunteers. We're going to keep going until, you know, you will be like Carthage. There won't be a stone left on the stone to and the next day, I get a letter that basically said, that's okay, tell the nice lady to, she doesn't have to worry about it, we're canceling the debt. Well, you know, when lawyers do stuff like that, you feel good for a week, some kind of vindication of justice, actually, at the heart of it, justice. What is justice? And 
It's a different subject for a different day, but it matters. You joke a little bit about Morrison Forrester and all of its volunteers getting behind something, but that is something that the firm has done on a number of occasions and gotten behind big pro bono efforts. I'm glad you mentioned that because from the earliest days, Bob Raven was our chair of the firm. And at that time, we were about, I guess, 80 lawyers. And he was devoted to pro bono work, among other good things. And he picked up on that. And he later became president of the American Bar Association. And he took that those ideas from the Bar Association of San Francisco, which he had also been president of, and he made that a national program, 5%. So our firm today is doing all kinds of pro bono things. I actually talked to somebody two days ago that's thinking about asking for pro bono help, and we may do that. But it's in the fiber of the firm, and I've been at the firm 47 years. And it's been in the fiber of the firm, and they've done some wonderful things. Let's take a step back so that we can get to Morrison Forrester and some of the trial work that you did there. Yeah. But let's go back to Harvard now. Okay. Did you meet anyone while you were there? (laughs) Well, I did, but I think I know what you're asking. I felt a little bit on one leg at the Harvard Law School. I liked it. I learned a lot. But there were a lot of of my classmates who were from the storied old institution. It took me a while to get to know a lot of them, which I did. But so one night, we had a house, six guys, as we used to say, and we decided we should have a cook. And I'd be good. And Carol Simon, one of our classmates, one of nine women in our class at the Harvard Law School in 1958, and she was going to be our cook. So uh, she came and she prepared oysters, Rockefeller, and apple crumb pie. And I don't want to disparage any cooking that I had had before that, but this was at a level that I had not encountered. And she looked at me and she said, there's a Catholic mixer uh, on Friday night. Are you going? And You know, I didn't know what to say, and I kind of mumbled, and I said, I can get my own dates, which at that time really wasn't correct. (laughs) Okay. I was in between, as we say. And we had decided we weren't going to date the cook because it would be messy, and we weren't going to do that. Three weeks later, Carol and I got engaged. Three weeks after that, we got married. And didn't go to class very much, I must say. And then when we graduated, we got in the car and we came out west. And um, so that's the story. My son, Jim, talks about the heroic trek west of Carol and I in the car. We didn't have much money and we didn't know anybody. But it was exciting. It was fun. And um, we were always been glad we did it. I love the west. It's a whole different subject, but. To be out in the Sierras now uh, with the views and all of that is a treat for me always. And at the risk of tangent, I'm going to give a plug for another podcast called Amicus Presents, and it's the class of RBG. Yeah. And it it is an interview of some of those nine women. Yeah. And a embarrassing dinner with the dean where the dean asked them to defend why they are there right and what they're going to do with their career to make up for the fact that a a man is not there what he said which is burned into carol's brain and rbg's brain as well because i've heard her tell the story she's not shy about it was it was the fourth year that they had women at the school dean griswold had them to dinner. So far, so good. And then he told them that it was too bad they were there taking the place of a man who could really do something with the education. Well, if you want to be known for a terrible thing, just look at nine women in the fall of 1956 and tell them that because they'll never forget it. They never did. 
three or four of the nine were judges. There were a couple of people who were professors in law schools and so forth. And he had stumbled into eternity as a retrograde male character, not understanding the potential. I had a case that involved Afghanistan. What hit me in that case was if you decide that you're going to exclude a group, any group, whether it's a minority or women, if you're going to make it harder for them to use their skills and their talent, you are depriving yourself as a country of the talent that you need. And if there's one thing I'm very sure about, it is that America needs all the talent we can get. And I'm glad that some progress is being made along those lines, but how many talented kids are out there that for various reasons of bias or prejudice are having difficulty contributing what they can contribute? And how do you know which ones are going to contribute? You never really know that. It's just my theory of inclusion, which is wildly vast quality. What is it? It means everybody gets a chance. You get a chance. And it ought to mean everybody gets an education, that education which they want. I think it's pretty simple, actually. And that seems to be a running theme in your efforts. As much as your career focused on trials, you also focused on lifting others up. Well, this would be so obscure before anybody's time, but I know too much about Irish history and my family. Six of my eight great-grandparents came out of the hunger in Ireland in the 1840s and early 1850s. They were on death ships. They survived. They were put in slums in North Point in Boston, required to live there. And they went on to overcome a great deal, really. That's something that it's just so long ago. But I have a case, I won't go into it particularly, but I went to Northern Ireland and investigated the murder of two lawyers. They were murdered only because of who they represented. And that's in the book. But I learned a lot about my family from just walking the streets of Belfast and the prejudice, which is also in the book, that exists today. And it's when you're on the wrong end of it, it's terrible. I want to take us now to Arizona and your first job as a practicing lawyer. Can you tell us what you did? I had a job as a plaintiff's, in a plaintiff's firm, a small plaintiff's firm, a very good plaintiff's firm. And uh, when I interviewed, I kept asking, you know, do you go to trial, go to trial? Well, they did, but I didn't. And I got lucky and got a job coming out of the Kennedy campaign, actually. Uh, I knew the new U.S. attorney, and he hired me. So I appeared uh, on a Monday morning, and on a so I Tuesday morning, my boss came in and he said, here's a file that's going to trial next Monday. I'm not totally sure whether he knew what was involved. And would you try it? I said, oh, yes. And I opened the file. It was a first-degree murder case with death penalty allegations. And that was my first trial. And that's in the book. And I've had several people who read the book say, gee, that doesn't sound right. Hell no, it wasn't right. (laughs) It was like, today, there's all kinds of procedures on death penalty and all that. But the story of the trial is in the book. The murder was juveniles who stabbed to death a member of the Apache tribe on the Pima Reservation south of Phoenix, and they were teenagers. Today, the law is that teenagers cannot be given the death penalty, which is a great advance, which is good. I have two different tracks that I want to go down to follow up on this. And the first is the, here's a file, go try the case. And this is a common thing I hear from lawyers who practiced before the Discovery Act. 
Yeah. And nowadays, here's a file, and three years from now, maybe you'll be in trial. You know, this intrigues me because you have to go through settlement conferences. The client, if it's a big case, they can't afford to pay $3 billion or whatever. And if they settle, they can settle for $800 million. These are real numbers. In those days, people went to trial. And I, when I went to Morrison Forrester, I started taking the young ones to trial because I know if you take a young lawyer to trial and they go through the trial, their perspective changes totally. It's like taking a young doctor to an operation and maybe even allowing them to do a little something. Then they get it. And what is it they get? They get the importance of trial. Civil lawyers talk a great deal about you can't get to trial because there's all these settlement conferences. More than once, I have looked at a settlement judge and I have said to a judge, kind of disrespectful judge, you don't know this case. I appreciate your efforts, but we have to go to trial on this case. So there are ways to get to trial, but on the criminal side, the numbers are down, but there are criminal trials. So the question is, what is your priority? And if trial is a priority, you want to be in a civil or criminal office where they go to trials enough. In that vein of the civil oh, and, and criminal, criminal opportunities, you made a career where you did both. Yep. And I can think of a handful of lawyers, most of them of your era, who have done something similar. Otherwise, for the most part, people seem to specialize. You may find a somebody who works as a prosecutor or a public defender who makes a crossing into civil at some point because they've got the trial experience. Yeah. But otherwise, it's exceedingly rare. How did you manage that? And what made you decide to do that? Well, remember when I started, I started in the year 1959. It was exactly the right time if you want to go to trial. That was exactly the right time. Uh, damages were going up. A man named Melvin Belli in San Francisco was making something called the Just Award, and he was getting more and more money. And the people I saw and admired, and I would go to programs just to hear them talk, were of a group. If you've tried one case, you can try them all. That was the conversation among trial lawyers at that time, and they proved it. Yeah, I can do that. I wanted to do that. My curiosity was such that I wanted to experience, I think, all kinds of cases. There are great advantages to specialization. We have it in our firm. If a person really likes technology, for example, and they liked it when they were young, uh, maybe they did some education that got them ready for patent cases. They have great advantages and there's disadvantages for somebody like myself because if I go into a case, I may be going against an expert who knows all about this. I'm thinking wrongful termination case I tried and the other lawyer, that's what he did. So you have to work harder, number one, but there's a better answer to your question. For 47 years, we started to put together trial teams, and given the momentous nature of some cases, the client tolerates that. So I would try a case, but I would have a patent lawyer with me, and depending on their background, they might do some witnesses. They might take the experts, for example. So that was one reason I wrote the book. I literally tried every kind of case and enjoyed it. It turned out that was a good thing. Child custody, for example. Divorce. I, d I did some in the early days. Divorce. And uh, admiralty. I tried seven admiralty cases. You get the idea. There's also a tension between the passion for trial and the negotiating aspect to try and get the best result for your client. And I know that some 
lawyers, some trial teams will staff that differently. There'll be a negotiating team and there'll, there'll be a trial attorney. So the trial attorney can stay focused. I get the impression from what I've read that you handled negotiations as well as trial. Is that true? <laughs> one day, uh, Jim Bennett, who's a wonderful trial lawyer, I, I tried cases with him and uh, he had a case and there was an issue there. I won't go into what the issue was, but he wanted me to help with the trial. He was going to try it and I would try it with him. So then when the trial was over, we had a meeting in the firm and a lot of the young lawyers came and they were asking questions about the trial. And one person asked me, they said, what did it feel like for you not to be in charge? And I said, I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> and Bennett didn't mind that. I was always lead counsel from April of 1961 until my last trial, which was about four years ago, and I stopped taking new clients. And what can I say? You've embarrassed me. I mean, I like that. <laughs> I really did. And people accepted it. I, I would take young lawyers with me. Their number are described in the book. There are times in the book where, yes, it's absolutely a memoir. There's no question about that. But it's often a memoir about other people. And young lawyers in our firm are some of the people featured in what they did and what they accomplished and how judges responded to them in a good way. Beyond memoir, I mentioned this to you before we started, the book reminds me a lot of Season of the Witch, which covers the 70s era of San Francisco because the nature of the cases that you handled involved rubbing shoulders and interacting with a lot of names that people will recognize. Not just trial lawyers, but politicians and celebrities. What can I say? I represented Willie Brown successfully for a total of an hour and a half. And uh, that might be the shortest representation ever. But I represented Mayor Moscone. I was representing him at the time that he was tragically killed. And he was mayor at the time. And there were several leaders that I represented one time or another, and I enjoyed that. I represented Diane Feinstein when she was mayor, and we went back to Washington and tried to straighten out the bureaucrats back there. Huh. So there was that, but close to my heart were the trial lawyers who was one reason I came to San Francisco from Phoenix was there were great trial lawyers at that time. And I knew that. I wanted to go against them, frankly, and I got to know a number of them. Let's cover that in terms of the chronology. Had an opportunity to move from the Arizona prosecutor's office to the San Francisco yes. the prosecutor's office. Right. Tell us how that came about. Well, it, you know, it's evidence of luck that I've had in my life. In Phoenix, there was a law clerk from with Judge Swigert, and they were visiting. A lot of judges in the Ninth Circuit felt compelled to come down to Phoenix in the wintertime and help us with our... <laughs> you know. Funny that. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Summertime, not so much. You know, it's 110. That we didn't get too much help in those days. But he was a law clerk, so we went and had a beer. And he said... Uh, I. He asked me what I was doing. I was looking for a job outside the office. And uh, he said, well, you know, the San Francisco office is looking for somebody who's tried criminal tax cases because the person who did that just left. I said, oh. So I thought, well, I mean, it's a long shot. And I don't know. And so when I went home and Carol was sound asleep, so... I walked in and she woke up and I said, there's a job in San Francisco and I'm thinking maybe I would apply. She got up out of bed without a word, went in the closet and took out a suitcase. And I took it from that, that she was prepared to move to San Francisco. 
And I got lucky, and Cecil Poole, this is in the book, what a real mentor he was to people in that office. They still meet for dinner. The, the grads and all of us are quite mature, and Cecil Poole was one of the people that just taught us how to use the power that we had. Prosecutors and lawyers, actually, are very powerful. Lawyers have the power of advice. We say something and somebody might do that, and you hope it's right. So that's how I got to San Francisco, and I was in the office for three years, so a total of five between Phoenix and San Francisco. And there I was trying cases against some of the best lawyers we've ever had here. And then a time came where you determined it was time to switch into private practice. It was. I tried a big criminal case, front pages, for a year. It was a bank failure, interestingly enough, because we just had a bank failure. And it was time to go, and I so I went to a very good uh, law firm, very old law firm, called Cooper White and Cooper, and I was there for nine years, uh, and they did try cases. And that was my condition when I interviewed. The other one was, I'm going to defend criminal cases. And Sheldon Cooper was a wonderful lawyer, and he was the head person of the firm, and he wasn't sure that was good. Would it be all right if I did it in my own name and not in the firm's name? You know, it was the old days. And you didn't have criminal lawyers in commercial law firms. You really didn't. And that was fine. So I went there, and that was a good experience for me. And I will need to point out for our listeners that Cooper White and Cooper, which I believe started in 1896, yes. is no relation to uh, Cooper's or me, this Cooper. Yes, yes. Sheld Cooper sat in the office his father had occupied when the firm opened in 1896. And so it was old San Francisco. From there, you got recruited to where you spent the rest of your career. I did. And can you tell us how that happened? In brief form, there's a story in the book about how six of us started a group of insurgents to overthrow the Senior Bar Association. It's too long a story, but it worked. And... Then we captured the nominating committee. It was the 60s. Your audience, I want to say to them, you had to be there. <laughs> the mood was, we're going to reform everything now. That, that'd be good. Let's do it now. So Bob Raven, as a result of our taking it over, he was nominated to be president-elect of the Bar Association. So he called me up a couple of years later. And he did a wonderful job with the bar. And he called me up, took me to lunch. And so we had lunch at the top of the Bank of America building. And he kept talking about his firm, Morrison, which I had a lot of respect for and so forth. But he didn't say, you know, we'd like you to come. So I thought about that. And I asked him the next day, I called him and I said, Thank, thanks for lunch. Were you suggesting something? He said, I was. And we talked and I went. I was the second person in the city to ever move from one firm to another. That's one of the big changes in the practice of law around the country. People move from one firm to another now. How do they get notice? But in those days, you went to a firm and you stayed there and that was it. So it was, it was different, but it was one of the best things I ever did. And I was very lucky. And that's it for today's episode. Tune in next week for part two of Jim Brosnahan. Thanks for listening.